Good afternoon. I'm Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this virtual Tuesday Scholar event. Today we present the final program in our series, Votes for Women, with Janet Woolman. Jan Woolman's appearance today is made possible through the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota, with financial support from the Friends of the Ramsey County Libraries. We are deeply grateful to both these organizations. Before I turn the virtual podium over to Ms. Woolman, I'd like to talk just a little bit about the technical aspects of this webinar. Today, we are using the Zoom webinar platform. You should see controls either at the bottom of your screen or at the top although they may be hidden until you move your cursor or touch the screen. Although your mic is turned off for this webinar, the chat box is available for you if you need some help with technical issues. You can open the chat box by clicking on the chat balloon icon. If you don't see the chat icon in your control bar, it may be hidden in the ellipses, the three dots. The Q&A box is available for questions on the content of the talk. Feel free to type in your questions at any time throughout the presentation, but we'll ask Ms. Woolman to wait until the end of her remarks before she turns to answering the questions. I will read the questions for her to answer. You can make use of the closed caption option to view subtitles for this talk by clicking on the CC Live Transcript button in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. This program runs for about an hour and a half, including both Ms. Woolman's presentation and the time for questions. We are recording this event for those who are not able to be present for the webinar. The recording will be made available on our website within a few days. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn things over to our speaker, Janet Woolman. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining again. Once again, I want to thank Judy and Greg um, for all their support and help. And finally today, we're going to get to the 19th Amendment. Lots of drama, even suspense today. We're going to cover the years, or we're going to cover the time period from the election of Woodrow Wilson in the fall of 1912 until the amendment is finally in effect, August 1920. And it's a very, very action-packed eight years. And I just thought I would kind of remind you of all the other stuff that's going on. Uh, during Wilson's presidency, there was significant progressive legislation um, and amendments passed, the Federal Reserve, the popular election of um, senators, the income tax. Starting in 1917, the United States will be fighting in World War I, so we have all the significant effect of that, not to mention the post-war period, um, the failure of uh, the United States to ratify the Treaty of Versailles. And then, of course, um, none of us perhaps need to be reminded that there's also an influenza pandemic going on. Um, so the suffrage movement is going to play out against all these other really significant events, and I think we'll see some impacts of them. So next slide, please. So you might remember that Teddy Roosevelt um, assumed the presidency when McKinley was assassinated in 1900. He ran again in 1904, and then he decided he really wanted to go on a safari, not to mention on his uh, adventuresome uh, trip to the Amazon. So he doesn't run in um, 1908. When he comes back, he's horrified that Taft, his um, uh, chosen predecessor, in fact, um, has not been progressive. So Roosevelt decides to run again. Well, the fact that the Republicans are split is one of the things I think that accounts for the presidency of Woodrow Wilson, the Democrat. He's gonna be the first Democrat elected since Grover Cleveland was elected in 1892. Next slide. So here we see the suffrage movement sitting, waiting at the church house door, uh, ignored by the Democrats and the Republicans. Roosevelt is probably a suffragist um, and um, 
doesn't have a firm plank in his platform, uh, but would have been her best hope, but not to be. Next slide. Okay. Alice Paul decides to do something really dramatic. So the day before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration, the day in fact he arrived in Washington, she plans a huge parade. Nine bands, four mounted brigades, 20 floats, tons of marchers carrying roses, lots of people from um, other countries. Next slide. So Wilson got off the train at Union Station and he expected he would be greeted by at least some people. So he said, where are all the people? And the police said, um, well, they're at the women's parade. Next. Um, so more than um, 8,000 marchers uh, marched down Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, it's a bit clipped off at the top, I guess. But anyway, this is Inez Mulholland, Mil um, martyred on a, on a horse. She led the parade. Um, this was the first protest march in Washington. And 8,000 marched, but 250,000 people watched it. Next slide. Um, so there are all types of groups marching in there, all types of groups, there we go, participated. College groups, state groups, professional groups, the men's league. Um, here we see the Harvard League, Wellesley, a group of uh, women medical workers, and as well as the men there. Next slide. Unfortunately, the, um, um, the parade followed segregation policies. So um, suffrage leader Mary Church Terrell, who was sort of always willing to compromise to do what she could to kind of um, work with others, she agreed that she would march with African-American women at the end of the parade. But Ida Wells Barnett did not. She stood on the, by, on the side of the um, sidewalk, waited until her Illinois delegation passed by, and then she joined them. And I think it says a lot that I, there's no evidence that when she joined them that the Illinois delegation had any problem at all because they were accustomed to working with her. Next slide. This has just been installed in Union Station in Washington, D.C. Uh, this year to commemorate Ida Wells Barnett. And I, I'm sure it's to commemorate her action during that, uh, during that parade, um, and certainly an appropriate memorial. Next slide. So here is uh, Marie Botton of Baldwin, who was a member of the Turtle Mountain Ojibwe group. Her father was an attorney. Her family moved to Washington. She worked as a clerk for her father. She ultimately went to law school, got her degree. So she, she chose to march in the group of women lawyers for the parade. Um, next slide. So there was even a pageant as they marched along on the steps of the Treasury Building. Uh, there was a pageant entitled Columbia Rising, and you, you know, probably kind of an Isadora Duncan kind of um, dancing pageantry. Um, next slide. So unfortunately, as the parade neared the end, they were met by ranks of rowdies. Um, men who were opposed to suffrage, um, and you know they were they were pretty rough. So there was kind of a big bruja um, criticizing the Washington police, and as a result, the police chief was in fact fired. Next slide. So that same year, this is kind of one of the stunts now that. Um, Suffrage, I'm not exactly a stunt, but an attention getting activity. Um, so women drove in a motorcade all over the country, collected 200,000 signatures on petitions and showed up in Washington. So it's one of a number of motorcades um, 
One woman, one suffragist even climbed a mountain um, to show her support. That fall, the uh, National Convention was held once again in Washington. So a group of women marched to the White House uh, to see Wilson who said he couldn't, he could not express an individual opinion. He was, um, he was so wishy-washy throughout th this whole process, but he started out saying, well, just because I'm president doesn't mean I could really, should even express my opinion. Catherine Hepburn's mother was a very active suffragist, and she said, well, if he'd brought up by an enfranchised mother, he'd know more of the needs of democracy. Kind of a throwback to the idea of Republican um, motherhood back in the early part of our country's history. Mothers are supposed to bring up sons to be good citizens. Next slide. So just clicking off some of the events of 1914, the year following uh, Lincoln, uh, Wilson's first term, the war begins in Europe. Paul decides that her party is, that her um, organization is going to start playing partisan politics. And that means that she's gonna hold the party in power accountable. So she's gonna to say to the Democrats, okay, if you don't move on suffrage, we're gonna to work to defeat uh, Democratic congressmen and senators. Elva Belmont, remember, Elva Vanderbilt Belmont, now switch, switches her support and resources to, the, to Paul's party. So there are gonna be more resources available. There does seem to be a loss of Democrats in Western suffrage states. And you know who knows whether this is just a normal midterm loss of the party in power, or whether it in fact reflects the work of the suffragists to campaign against them. And a little forecast of things to come. Um, a woman stands up in, uh, during Wilson's annual message and unfurls a banner. Uh, next slide. So here's a map of the situation in 1914. The dark pink states um, have, um, are states that, that allowed women's suffrage before the turn of the century, the turn of the turn of the 20th century. The light pink states are states that have um, given women's suffrage by 1914. And I think it's really remarkable uh, or notable that the states that have granted suffrage are tend to all be in the West. I think that by today's sense, we would expect that it would be those Northeastern states um, that would do so first. But in fact, those Northeastern states are um, going to be hard nuts to crack uh, throughout the whole process, as we shall, we shall see. Next slide. So I thought we should look a little bit at what's going on here in Minnesota, which had a very active suffrage moment. Um, the first recorded or the first acknowledged speech was made in, 19, in 1858, which is of course the year that Minnesota became a state. And the first suffrage club in Hennepin County forms just 10 years later. So the, the roots of the suffrage movement here go, go way, way back. Next slide. Next slide. There was an anti-suffrage movement here in Minnesota, as well as throughout the country, and we'll talk much more about them later. Uh, but this is a little pamphlet preserved by the uh, Historical Society. I wanted to show it to you because it shows a red rose. And throughout all this, wearing a red rose, carrying a red rose, will symbolize being an anti-suffragist. The suffragist color throughout this has been yellow so that they were um, into yellow roses. So Clara Ewan, um, maybe she's somebody you've heard of, she was certainly one of the most active suffrage leaders in Minnesota. Um, there were dozens of organizations and she was involved in many of them. She had a working relationship with Nellie Griswold Francis, who was a black activist working for suffrage in St. Paul. She was particularly interested in anti-lynching measures. So she kind of served as a bridge from Yulin to try to get more black women to rally for suffrage. 
and in return, Ulan lobbied for the Minnesota anti-lynching law, anti-lynching law, which passed in 1917. Didn't prevent the Duluth lynchings that happened 100 years ago, but Minnesota was certainly an early state uh, putting this into legislation. Next slide. The National Women's Party also had a presence in Minnesota. There's Sarah Coleman, who was a nurse, but active in the party. Myrtle Kane, who became involved in the party at a very young age, and at a young age in 1922, became the first, mem first female member of the Minnesota legislature. The local party sent picketers to New York. We're going to hear a lot about the pickets um, later. But here's a group of Minnesota women who show up in February um, to go and take their, their time on the picket line. Um, next slide. Here we've got a photo of the University of Minnesota Suffrage Club. And we also have a yearbook page from the South High School Tiger showing the South High Suffrage Club. So apparently some girls in high schools um, got the right to vote in school elections. Next slide. Hmm. Next slide. So Yulin organized um, a parade in 1914. Uh, they marched downtown Minneapolis from 2nd Avenue to 4th Street to Nicollet Avenue and then toward the city auditorium. Next slide. All kinds of people in the parade, men and women, high school students, university students, little kids, Boy Scouts, 40 women on horseback, <clears throat> even Julie Plant dressed up as Joan of Arc. Um, and there was a receptive audience, decorations in the windows, church bells ringing. Um, Mayor and the chief of police apparently had supported it. And here we have a picture, not surprisingly, of the Scandinavian Women's Suffrage Association, which had been organized seven years earlier. Next slide. This maybe you have seen and maybe you haven't. Um, I didn't see it. Actually, I drove over to see it this week because one of the, these pictures is mine. <clears throat> There's a memorial to the women Minnesota suffragists. It's on the Capitol grounds. Um, it's really cool. When you, you stand in front of these metal pipes, you look through it to beautiful gardens beyond. And in the upper left, we have kind of our, kind of our standard photo of the old white uh, women suffragists. But on the right, I want you to, I want to point out, there's Nellie Griswold um, Francis is memorialized in this memorial as well. Next slide. Well, back to the national scene. So Paul takes her party to every state. They sponsor yet another motorcade, um, which you know, produces a lot of excitement. But unfortunately, attempted referendums in the Northeast, in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and New York, all fail. Um, and you know, this is pretty late. This is four years before the amendment um, will be uh, approved by Congress. However, Wilson budges a little bit and he makes the effort to travel to New Jersey to vote in favor of the state's referendum. It failed, but by doing so, he communicates that his support would be for individual states taking action. He still has not moved to a position of supporting a federal amendment. Next slide. So the loss of the New York referendum uh, was devastating because they had worked so hard pulling out all the stops. Kat was involved, was the leader of the New York campaign, working again with Harriet um, Blatch. But she apparently proved her effectiveness again. So she once again becomes head of the uh, national organization. So now we've got Cat versus Paul. We've got two major suffrage groups, and we're going to see that they're going to take very different approaches to gaining suffrages. 
One thing they unfortunately have in common is that both groups continue um, their racist policies. But we have a plenty of evidence to suggest that there was lots of work privately across color lines. Next slide. 1916, another big year. Wilson wins. He doesn't win as much as he had won in 1912, but he wins. And Jeanette Rankin becomes the first woman member of Congress elected from Montana. Both parties move a little bit. They, their platforms say it would be nice to have women's suffrage, but they don't support yet a federal amendment. Here's a diversion between Paul um, and Kat. So the, the National Women's Party opposed all Democratic candidates, but Kat is confident that if she just keeps at it, she can ultimately get Wilson to support the movement. So she is careful never to antagonize him. Next slide. Now we move to drama. The uh, Silent Sentinels begin in 1917. Early in the year, Paul sends Sentinels to pick up the White House every day. This will go on for, um, for two years. And at some points, there were as many as 2,500 women who had come from across the country and who were here, were in Washington, available to pick up. And it all began very cordially. Wilson would drive um, in his car through the, the gates to the White House, and as he did so, he would tip his hat. At one point, apparently, he sent someone out to ask them if they didn't want to come in and get a little bit warm. Um, I suspect his second wife, Edith, if she was in the car, was gritting her teeth, but that's another story. Um, next slide. When the U.S. enters the war on April 6th, this is going to change the nature and the, um, the temper of the White House protests. <coughs> Excuse me. So Kat is a pacifist. She reluctantly supports the war. She promises that, that women will do whatever is asked of them to win the war, and she continues to work for suffrage. Jeanette Rankin, who has just been elected, is one of more than 100 representatives to vote against the war. She was a real pacifist. She will serve one term and will leave office in early 1919. Um, <coughs> well, she will serve actually a couple terms. Um, and then in 1940, she will be reelected just in time to be the single person who will vote against World War II. <laughs> and there's a, a photo of her in 1968 back in Washington to march in a uh, anti-Vietnam protest. She was consistent. Next slide. Now, things are going to change, and I kind of need to, to set the scene here. So this is June 1917. Um, in February or March, depending on your calendar, the first Russian revolution has occurred. That toppled the czar. For a while, there is hope that Russia will develop into a democracy. Once we join the war in April, we are going to be allied with Russia. So in June, a group of envoys from Russia appear at the White House probably to talk about how they can coordinate things, work together, um, whatever. So the um, picketers are aware of this and they post a sign visible to the Russians as they enter the White House grounds. And the gist of it is, don't look to America as a model as you think about democracy, because in America, democracy is in name only. This draws angry bystanders who do things like tear signs, rush the suffragists, and so forth. But the protesters are arrested and charged with obstructing the sidewalk. 
um, and they were sent to jail and then released. And they just said, look, keep moving. Next slide. But that didn't help because they are going to be accosted by more protesters, by counter protesters on the 4th of July. And the 4th of July, what they're doing is they're holding up posters that simply quote what Wilson has said as a reason for fighting the war. Remember, we're fighting to make the world safe for democracy. So five women are, are, are sentenced and they only they spend three days in prison. But during this two period, there will be almost 500 women arrested for picketing and close to 170 will serve some time in prison. Next slide. Then on July 14th, uh, again, noting a day um, supposedly of uh, democracy, um, 16 women were sentenced and now they're sentenced to 60 days and they're sentenced to a workhouse in Virginia. And here you have a, a little sense of what the um, quality of the workhouse was. Somebody I think asked earlier about the um, reactions of husbands whose wives were involved in this. Well, they were outraged. And throughout this, this will be a real driving factor to get the women out of jail because a number of the husbands of the women who are picketing are actually officials in the Wilson administration. Next slide. Well, you can imagine that this poster would be pretty provocative. So it's pulled out on August 10th. We're now calling Wilson a Kaiser. And um, you can imagine what this would be like in the, in the height of, of World War I, um, you know, passion. So um, they send more to the workhouse. Um, and then Lucy Barnes and 12 other pickets were going to be sentenced to 60 days in the workhouse. And as soon as Lucy Burns, who actually was a close friend of Paul's, um, organized a strike, uh, they were all moved into solitary confinement. Next slide. So Paul herself went out um, carrying a sign on October 6th. Usually she'd kind of been in the background coordinating things. And somebody grabbed, grabbed her sign and um, they were arrested but released on parole. Sorry, next slide. So once she was released, she put on her fur, fur coat, she violated her parole, she went back on the line. Again, using his own words, uh, we shall fight for those things which we hold most dear to our heart, democracy. So she and, and three other women were arrested, including Dr. Spencer, who was in poor health. And she was carrying a sign, resistant to, tyr to tyranny is obedience to God. Next slide. So they are now sentenced to seven months in the district jail. This is the longest sentence ever. Um, there's Dr. Spencer, um, the other two women who were arrested. Next slide. So now Paul's in prison. She actually will serve a total of only five weeks, I say only, but she does a lot while she's there. One of the first things she did was to break a window because the air in the, the prison was so foul. Then she sent out a message asking that she'd be considered to be a political prisoner. Then she went on a hunger strike, which she had done previously, you remember, in England. Um, they force fed her. And then finally, I guess as a last resort, they sent her to a psychiatric ward. And um, because they, you know, want to show that she's um, insane. So what the doctors decide is that she has a quote, an irrational obsession with her mistreatment at the hands of the President of the United States. Next slide. More shots of the um, workhouse conditions. In the right, you see an older woman being helped as she's leaving, um, the, the sparseness of the cell. And, you know, the, the force feeding was horrible because um, 
if women did not allow uh, themselves to be fed through the mouth, they forced tubes up, um, up their nose. Um, so it just sounds dreadful. Next slide. So while Paul was in prison, Lucy Burns led a number of women to protest her incarceration. Next slide. So then Burns was arrested. And I think this is, was like the low point of um, the whole experience. So 40 women were taken to the workhouse in Virginia. They began their hunger spike, strikes or force fed. The first night in jail, which is November 15th, uh, Lucy Burns had her hands cuffed, and fastened over her head to the cell door all night, was stripped in front of male guards. And the next day, her lawyer found her curled up on the floor, wrapped up um, in a blanket. She didn't open her mouth. She um, smuggled out a note saying, no one's bleeds freely, tube drawn out, covered with blood. See, this is dramatic. Next slide. So finally, on March 4th, 1918, um, a court of appeals in the District of Columbia declared the arrests unconstitutional. So 218 suffragists were immediately released from custody. Next slide. But the picketing continued. So on August 6th, um, there was a protest in Lafayette Square Again, they were met by uh, counter protesters and four dozen women were arrested and they were charged with climbing a statue. Statue, not statute, <laughs> sorry. Sentenced to 10 to 15 days in the district uh, workhouse. Next slide. But they were released just five days later. Um, and at which point they got a permit and marched right back to the statue. And here's a, uh, just one example of just the countless unsung heroines of this effort. This is Hazel Hunkins, who is from Billings, Montana. She had gone from Billings and grad attended Vassar, graduated from Vassar, went back to Billings. Her major had been chemistry. She applied to teach chemistry at the local high school but they wouldn't let her, she could teach anything else because teaching chemistry was obviously uh, reserved for men. So she got caught up in the suffrage movement. She went to Washington to pick it, and she did, um, and returned for serving time in prison. She, um, she got this brooch on the right. This is a, a brooch that Ellis Paul had made and gave to every suffragist who served time in prison. Next slide. So Richard Terrell joined the protest, sometimes brought along her daughter Phyllis to uh, swell out the numbers. And according to Hazel Hunkins, Paul actually considered Terrell a personal friend. Um, you know, again, the, this complex relationship between the suffragists and African Americans that um, Paul uh, was hardly free from the racism we've seen in other suffragists. But, you know, it's example of private behavior sometimes is different. Next slide. So the final, final uh, demonstrations, starting in December of 1918, Paul um, starts Watch for His for Freedom. And they set up a kind of a, I guess, a, what we would call a fire pit today then they're going to keep burning it until um, Wilson moves to support suffrage. Next slide. So, not to be, have a pun, but the whole situation does heat up uh, when the protesters burn Wilson's image in effigy. They actually burn just a paper doll that looked like Wilson at the White House. So um, Sue Shelton White, 30 other women were arrested. 
but they were soon released. And as soon as White was released, she and a bunch of others chartered a railroad car called the Prison Special and had it driven all over the country um, to campaign for suffrage. So this is a pretty dramatic event. And um, this pretty much ended the picketing because as we shall soon see, by this time, Wilson has begun to change his mind and is actively supporting um, the amendment. Next slide. Okay. So we've, we've kind of played out what the National Women's Party is doing from 1917 to 1919. Let's go back now and look at what the National Association is doing. So 1916, Kat came up with what she called her winning plan. And if you remember previously um, in the 1890s and up and through, in fact, 1916, the effort of the NAWSA has been not to get a federal amendment, but to try to go at state by state by state. So Kat has now decided to work for a federal amendment, but she's gonna work for it at all levels. In other words, she's gonna work in states to build up enough support so that when the amendment is proposed in Congress, there will be enough supporters to pass it. She's not gonna work on any states that aren't winnable. Um, she's gonna pressure politicians from states where women could vote. And the whole thing is gonna be much more coordinated. So it'll, it's gonna be a much more unified um, effort. Next slide, please. One of the best things Kat did is to hire Maud Wood Park to, to spend her time in Washington lobbying representatives and senators. And Maud and her volunteers were known as the front door lobby, as opposed to the back stairs lobbyists. Apparently, special interests sent lobbyists to confront senators and representatives out of sight on the back stairs. But the suffragists are at the front door. At any rate, uh, Susan Ware thinks that were it not from Wadwood Parks, this never would have happened. And here we have the little cheat sheet for the volunteers who are gonna go around and lobby. Um, don't nag, don't boast, don't threaten, don't lose your temper, don't stay too long, don't let anybody hear what you're doing. Um, and, and so forth. And this advice, you know, as to how to handle the lobbying, of course, is coupled with meticulous record keeping. Every representative, every senator, what needed to be done in order to get their support? What, what were their kind of weak points? Next slide, please. Meanwhile, Cat and Blanche, and Cat uh, um, supports another suffrage parade in New York City to support the state referendum. So once again, thousands of women marched down Fifth Avenue. Uh, and as part of this, Blanche and Cat make clear that people should not be swayed by the National Women's Party tactics. And I, I think you can begin to see the, the benefit of those tactics because then Kat and Blatch can say, well, well, look, we are reasonable, we are moderate, we are not, you know, off the deep end like the National Women's Party. So that supporting us is, 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 is the thing to do. And there were a number of black women among the 20,000 marchers. Next slide. In fact, here's the Colored Women's Equal Suffrage League of, of Brooklyn, led by Sarah um, Garnett and Irene Mormon. And um, it, it, I think in about 1910, Elva Belmont tried to reach out to them um, to, um, to draw them into the suffrage movement. And they essentially said, well, thank you, but we're just doing fine with our own suffrage movement. 
But what, what came out of this is that Belmont was willing to provide resources to this group and others so that it could more successfully um, campaign for suffrage. Next slide. Finally, the New York referendum passes by a huge margin. And a lot of the credit goes to Vera Whitehouse, who was one of those so-called socialites. But again, just the example of the meticulous um, coordination, record keeping, organizing volunteers, intense lobbying. And it was also helped by the fact that, you know, black leaders, Du Bois and Adam Clayton Powell, this is Adam Clayton Powell Sr. We maybe remember Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Um, so that, you know, lots and lots of voters are, not, are now brought in and support this. This is, this is considered to be a huge victory. Next slide. So now, Washington. So finally, Wilson urges Congress to support suffrage as a wartime measure. He goes and meets with a number of representatives and urges them to pass it. So um, Jeanette Rankin introduces it. Um, Wilson helped round up the votes. So it just passed with exactly the, num the needed two thirds votes. Um, one representative, as I say here, just laid to having a shoulder reset. Another was also ill. He made sure to turn up. So it passed the House. This is a big milestone. Next slide. So now Wilson moves even further in support of women's suffrage. Um, and he goes and speaks in Congress. He, he, one of the first presidents to do so. The senators apparently were not um, thrilled that he was interfering in their um, deliberations. But he now is connecting the need for suffrage to recognize what the women have done in the war. Next slide. So, um, Kat, who has supported Wilson, um, takes credit that she has patiently brought the president around. Um, she has not antagonized him. She has supported the war. And now Wilson is fully on board. The Senate does not vote um, for the amendment, but it looks like the path might be clear. Alice Paul insisted that she should take credit for it because of the um, demands that they've made because they have forced the president into acknowledge that democracy needed to begin at home. And the author of Elaine Weiss's book, The Woman's Hour, concludes they're both right. And, you know, I think it kind of makes sense. We have kind of a two-pronged movement um, moving in, and they both maybe deserve credit. Next slide. And here are some of the uh, propaganda or the I guess we could still call it propaganda, you know, pointing out the, uh, the effort that women have made in the war. The country's getting the women's service. Are the women going to get it, enfranchisement? And then, you know, on the other side, we have listed of, of all the different things that they've done. Next slide. Now, all this is going on in the midst of the influenza pandemic. And Carrie Chapman Cat got it. Um, and she got it in October of 1918. And just as a, as a point of reference for all of us right now, since the figure is similar, but it's estimated that maybe 200,000 Americans, 200,000 Americans died just in October, 1918. And I thought you might enjoy some little references, um, similarities to our current situation. But some historians think that um, these two other huge happenings, the flu and the war, you know, actually helped the suffragists cause. Um, in November 18, Democrats lost control of the Senate. 
that meant that a lot of pro-suffrage lawmakers were voted in. Um, and so as the, as the historian I've cited below says, you know, that, that, that maybe people started really to buy the rhetoric about their patriotism and their contributions to the war. And, you know, maybe the, the, the flu sort of opened up people uh, to more possibilities. But I just want to point out that this, this, is, this is, has other significance. Um, so losing the Senate to the Republicans in 1918 might have opened up the way for the 19th Amendment, but it was a big factor in um, the fact that the Senate refused to ratify the Treaty of Versailles. So, it, you know, it's like a double-edged sword here. Next slide. So in order to, to bring up the amendment, Wilson has to call a special session, and he did. So um, the House passed the amendment solidly, and finally, the Senate passes it. So June 4th, 1919 is the date that the amendment is approved by Congress. Next slide, please. So as soon as this happens, Alice Parr, Paul begins sewing a star on a banner for every state that's ratified it. Next slide. But it's gonna be really hard because the anti-suffragists are gonna turn out in full force. Here we have a little sign, headquarters of the Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage. And Harriet Stanton Blatch herself observed, in fact, if both sides had just stayed home and argued pleasantly and prayed, the antis probably would have won out. So the country is much more divided than we might have perceived. Next slide. So once again, why oppose suffrage? Obviously many people saw this as a perceived threat to traditional family structure, patriarchy. Many people believed, men I suppose believed, maybe women too, that women just simply lacked the intellectual ability to vote and to deal with political topics female irrationality. And many, many people fear that women would lose their privileged status within the home and family. Separate spheres. Next slide. Many, many, many other reasons. Religious beliefs, um, it felt that it was gonna be like hard on children because women would not be fulfilling their duties to the home. And the third one is kind of interesting that there were a lot of people who felt that women who now had become really active in a variety of social change movements in a nonpartisan way, if they are able to vote, it's going to sort of ruin their ability to kind of stand back and, and focus on the change because now they're going to have to deal with the, um, all the mess of the of political system. Voting is only a small part of government, that these movements to affect social change maybe are just as important. <clears throat> lots of racism, lots of racism, particularly in the South, increasingly wanting to make sure that blacks don't vote anywhere. And then of course, after the war, many people feel that the suffrage movement are actually Bolsheviks, radical uh, radicals. And then last but not least, or maybe not last, but another reason. There are ind industries who want to prevent it. You know, I mentioned the liquor interest before, but the textile manufacturers don't want any regulations on working conditions for women. The railroad don't want any more regulations. And there's kind of assumption now that if women have a vote, um, that, that, that they will you know, work for things like this. Next slide. So, there's the National Association to Oppose Women's Suffrage, 
Josephine Dodge was head of it. Uh, Minnie Bronson was second in command. They have a huge number of um, members. They uh, publish a newsletter that helped defeat, at least according to this source, more than 40 uh, referenda. Next slide. And I thought this is kind of interesting. On the left, you have a anti-suffragette uh, thing. You can't read all of the steps, but you get the idea that woman starts with love, marriage, children, home, uh, and then ambition. And if ambition leads her all the way up, notice how far away she has gone from her children. And notice what's at the top, not glory, but a dead plant. On the right, this is part of the memorial at the Capitol here in Minnesota. Completely different interpretation. Here we start with slavery, drudgery, and then all the very limiting kind of, um, kind of careers. At the top um, is president. So kind of two different visions of uh, ladders to climb. Next slide. There were some really surprising anti-suffragists. So Ida Tarbell, you may remember, was the journalist who brought down, or who didn't bring down, but who certainly uh, wrote an expose on uh, John D. Rockefeller. Would not expect her. She's a professional journalist. Um, but she sort of bought into the idea that if women were in voting, they would be caught up in this whole partisan world. Some sources suggest that there's just a lot of kind of internal conflicts, but nevertheless, she spoke and supported the anti-suffragists. Emma Goldman, who is a, is a radical and anarchist, felt that, that it was just pointless, that if you gave women the right to vote, it's the same political system, the same economic system, no change, so that it was kind of irrelevant. And who would ever dare call Eleanor Roosevelt an anti-suffragist? So apparently she wasn't so much opposed to it, it's just not necessarily uh, in favor of it. When Franklin announced his support for suffrage in 1911, she was actually kind of surprised. So even though she was not involved in the suffragist movement, as soon as the amendment was passed, during the 20s, she involved herself in lots of different women's groups. Next slide. So, a year, a little over a year after Congress approved the amendment, 35 states have ratified it, 12 have rejected it. So it's down to Tennessee. So everybody, who's who in the suffrage movement and in the anti-suffrage movement is going to show up in Nashville. So um, Carrie Chapman Cap arrives. Um, she will work with Ann Dudley, who um, was a member of the national organization, but who's from Tennessee. So Sh Sue Sheldon White is also from Tennessee, and she represents the National Women's Party. And it's really important that White and Dudley were there because they knew the political system. They knew what had to be done um, to get this through the legislature there. Next slide. So Kat checked into the Swank um, um, Hermitage Hotel, Hermitage, not Heritage, sorry. That's, that is a autofill. <laughs> Um, but so did the anti-suffragist leaders. Hermitage, you know, was Andrew Jackson's home, so a little error there. At any rate, here we see Nina Pincard um, celebrating with the anti-suffragists. Here we see a little um, dinner for them. And I thought it was kind of cool. This year, um, their website for the Hermitage Hotel announced that they are serving um, suffrage-themed craft cocktails. Next slide. So, more anti-suffragists. 
Now, we talked about these two women before. You may remember um, Laura Clay and Kate Gordon. Somebody asked me if, if Laura Clay was related to Henry Clay, and I checked. Her grandfather was a cousin of Henry Clay's. Her father was actually an, an abolitionist. An interesting, interesting person. She was a lifelong Democrat. She supported L. Smith in 1928. But she was also um, concerned about a federal amendment because the amendment came with an enforcement clause and she felt that it could be used to force the South to change their special system of voting, meaning you know, Blacks. And the same situation with Gordon. So both, both of these women switched sides because they didn't want a federal amendment they wanted the states to have control or who could vote. Um, Josephine Pearson was the um, state chair of the anti-suffrage movement. Um, Nina Picard was from Tennessee. Charlotte Rowe was from New York and came into town to help with the campaign. Notice they're meeting at the Ryman Auditorium, which might ring a bell with you as the place for the uh, Grand Ole Opera. Next slide. So lots of women came for the National and for the National Women's Party. Um, and set up booths, did marches, hobnobbed with politicians. And but probably most significantly, they created a card on every legislator. And it listed there the kind of information they had there, including a little confidential memo, memo on any kind of indiscretions. Okay, next slide. This is a memorial that was erected in Nashville to commemorate the, the Tennessee um, women who were involved, including Frankie Pierce, uh, Sue White and Ann Dudley, and Kara Chaplin is also part of the, uh, this memorial. Next slide. So in order to do this, um, there has to be a special session. And Governor Robert Rogers was a fan of Wilson. Wilson urged him to call the special session, but Rogers waited until he won his primary. So he felt that um, it was somewhat politically safe. So he called a special session. And immediately, vicious stuff, mayhem, drama, and intrigue follow. If you want to read, I think, of the best account of the battle in Tennessee, Elaine Weiss's The Woman's Hour. It also does a really good job discussing the whole suffrage movement, but particularly on the unbelievable stuff that goes on in these couple weeks in August. So the state Senate passes it. And so now the House, nobody knows what's gonna happen. Next slide. So they all get together, the antis, the subs are in the galleries, they're gonna vote. They start um, reading the roll and they don't get very far before they get to Harry Byrne. Harry Byrne was 24 years old. It was his first term in the legislature. He was from Neota, Tennessee, which is in the Eastern part of the state. He's concerned about winning again um, and he's sporting a red rose. He's, a, he's an anti-suffragist. But when they get to Harry's name, he says, I. And people are floored. So then they go on and read the rest of the role and they get to uh, Banks Turner. And he, he just stands there. He doesn't say anything, he's mute. So the clerk records him as not voting. They go on, everybody else announces their vote and it's tied. Turner stands up and says, Mr. Speaker, I wish to be recorded as voting aye. And that's it. Next slide. 
Who could make this up? So why did Byrne change his position? Well, he got a letter from his mother. We see on the left, the, the real letter, and I, I typed it up there for you on the right. But the key thing, his mother wrote him and said, don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat. And he did. Um, and he was then attacked round soundly by the anti-suffragists. They accused him of being bribed. They tried, um, they called all of his integrity into question. So he wrote a statement and he said, you know, okay, I support suffrage, but I knew a mother's advice is always safest for a boy to follow. And my mother advised me to vote for suffrage. So he did. Well, Harry did win re-election narrowly. He went on to serve in the state Senate in Tennessee. He ran for governor, but did not win in 1930, um, but was involved in all kinds of, of, of civic things in, uh, in Nashville. Next slide. So now it has happened, but it wasn't quite this easy because between the 18th and the 26th, the anti-suffrage pulled out all the stops. They went to court. Uh, people in the, in the uh, Tennessee legislature in the House tried to get the vote uh, tabled, reconsidered, but it, it didn't happen. So narrowly, 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 the approval of, this, of Tennessee survived. Amendments become official when the Secretary of State um, accredits them, signs them. So um, they sent the documents from Tennessee. They arrived in Washington, I think at four o'clock in the morning on the 26th. Secretary of State uh, Colby um, signed the, the, the amendment into, into being effective at his home with only the person who delivered it to him present. So there's no photo, there's no moment at which uh, we can see the actual um, official moment. But here's Alice Paul celebrating uh, the victory. Uh, next slide. So now what? Well, now what is a whole other story, the results of the 19th Amendment. But one of the direct results is the creation of the League of Women Voters, and it was founded by Carrie Chapman Catt in January 1920. And the organization has continued to follow her approach, nonpartisan, uh, you know, opening politics uh, to the involvement of, of others. Next slide. Following her line of thinking, uh, the ERA was written by Alice Paul and the help of Crystal Eastman. You may remember that Crystal Eastman's brother had been the manager for the Men's League in New York. So they submit to Congress the ERA in 1923. But there was kind of a long running conflict because a lot of women had worked earlier to get special protection for women. So for example, in the Supreme Court case, Mueller versus Oregon in 1908, Oregon um, had passed a law um, limiting the maximum number of hours for women and the Supreme Court had upheld this. So this idea, should women be treated specially because of their traits as women, or should they be treated equally? Um, you know, I, I think kind of continues. But here we have a photo of Alice Paul in 1969, still alive, um, still supporting the ERA, which of course will be approved by Congress in 1972, but still lacks one vote of being um, ratified. Next slide. And the anti-suffragists persisted. They didn't just stop in Tennessee. Um, it wasn't until 1922 that the Supreme Court finally ended the legal battle over whether Tennessee's vote was legal or not. And interestingly, it was handed down uh, by Justice Brandeis. But the anti-suffragists don't go away. If, if you wanted to, you could go back and trace organization by organization, person by person. And there really is a direct line 
from the anti-suffragists in 1920 to Phyllis Shapley of the 1970s and 80s. Next slide. Then of course, what happened is the 20s. So the first president that women, now that women have the vote, right to vote all over the country is Warren Hardin. Well, maybe not such a great result. And I'm not sure that Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton spent their whole lives to get suffrage for women. I'm not sure how they would react to the emergence of the flapper in the 1920s. But of course, that is a whole other story. Next slide. So many historians, you know, feel that the suffrage movement really was significant, not just because it got women, many women, the right to vote, but because of it, it, it kind of sets what you do if you're going to do um, a social movement. Uh, and both um, Susan Ware and Elaine Weiss, Elaine Weiss, focus on the quality of lobbying. Um, and Ware quotes. Nancy Cott saying um, that the lobbying route should be pioneering the modern mode of exerting political force. And, you know, you think of the, the intense, intense lobbying today, you know, following this kind of meticulous work that, that the suffragists did. But the marches, the picketing, no other group had picketed the White House before this. Uh, the stunts, the climbing the mountain, the motorcades, the kind of breaking up the um, centennial of the Declaration of Independence. And of course, the nonviolent resistance, the kind of willingly breaking the law um, and then, you know, suffering for it. Next slide. So I just have one final comment that um, I've, I've often run into people and I've, I've certainly gotten this from, from a variety of sources kind of, of a reluctance to be, you know, engaged in, in learning about the suffrage movement. Because people will say, well, they were all, they were all racist. And it's true of every single one of these leaders here of the suffrage movement. We have seen their racist statements and their racist actions. True, you know, as I said from the beginning, no problem acknowledging this. <laughs> But the problem is, is that if you um, deny looking at what these women have done, next slide, please. You are muffling the voices and ignoring the actions of all of these women. Um, these are just the women's photos that I have included in my presentation. And believe me, it's just scratching the surface. There's an article in the New York Times today about Civil War historians visiting, um, well, of American historians visiting Civil War monuments, um, you know, in this kind of debate we have today about what to do with them. And their advice is to widen our lens, more history. And I might be biased, but more history sounds kind of good to me. Thank you. I'm sorry I've run over a little bit. That's it. More history sounds good to the rest of us, too. Thank you very much, Janet Woman. And now uh, is the time for the audience uh, to enter questions in the Q&A file. And uh, we'll put them to uh, Jan one by one. But uh, now is your chance to write in questions about this uh, talk. And the first question, I, I think this is more of a comment. And maybe you would want to comment on the comment, Jan. Okay. Uh, this person says, in today's environment, the protests by these women would have been branded as anti-police and anti-law and order. Do you want to speak well, on that? I don't know. You don't think that climbing statues and blocking um, sidewalks is, is threatening our public safety? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. And of course, it was perceived that way back then, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I agree. I mean, that's, you know, kind of something to reflect on, I think. All right. Um, next question uh, was, oh, sorry. Next question. Um, was Minnesota one of the 35 states that ratified the amendment? 
Yes, I should have. I, I, I neglected to put that in here. They, uh, they ratified it that fall. They were very early to ratify it. Yes. Okay. The next question is, how many people registered for this class and are now enlightened? I don't quite understand the question and, and why this is being put to you. Um, the number of people who registered for the class, both through the library and through the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, I think all told it was close to 300, if I'm not oh mistaken. Oh my God. <laughs> so lots of people. So I, I don't know if you want to comment on, uh, maybe you want to go further with, with the idea that um, what you alluded to in the, at the end about people we, we view the suffragists through the prism of current history and uh, uh, the fact that their racism, their acknowledged racism, maybe blots to some degree out their achievement in a modern um, view. Well, you know, there's obviously it, 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 lots of contrary social suffragists. I just, I just want to say that enlightening anybody makes me kind of nervous, right? <laughs> but you know, I did spend a good part of my life teaching history and um, I, I do kind of think it's important to study it. And I think, you know, I, I, I tried and, and um, one never succeeds because I am limited by my own, uh, my own knowledge. Um, but I think it's really important um, to have a, uh, again, an expanded lens, but to kind of, you know, look at what happened. Um, let's have full information about what really happened. Then we can draw conclusions and then we can discuss it. But if we look at history through a really narrow lens, um, you know, we're, we're just not getting the full story. But knowing that it's impossible ever to get the full story. Um, we can never go back and know exactly what happened. The next question um, was the idea of taxation without representation ever used widely as a legal effort, maybe a, a legal argument uh, in terms of uh, women's getting women getting the vote. Well, we, we saw, I think, in the second session, the protest um, that the suffragists at that point put up on the um, 100th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party. Um, and I don't, I, I don't know if anybody went to court on, on that. Um, I, I should, something I, I, I did fail to mention, um, actually, I'll throw this in here, it's not completely related to taxation. The ERA has not passed. I did want to make the point that women have, um, through laws and through Supreme Court decisions, gained a lot of rights since 1920. Um, for example, in 1965, um, the court ruled that states could not prohibit doctors from sharing information about contraception with women, 65. Um, but I also wanted to mention again, and I have been practicing saying her name with Bader Ginsburg this time, since I went <laughs> out in her last time, last time. But, but, you know, her contributions were like picking away little right by little right by little right. And I'm not familiar with anything, you know, she did with taxation. But for just one example, she, one of her cases secured the right of women, married women, to be able to have a credit card without their husband's permission. When I got married, I couldn't do that. So th there have been all kinds of things like this, but I, I don't know of any, um, you know, issues. Obviously, issues you know surrounding Social Security, which isn't taxation, but is you know kind of related. So anyway, long-winded answer to that. Um, uh, uh, as a historian, what aspect of suffrage would you most like to see, see studied more fully? Um, what, what, what leaps to mind is um, the tenacity. Be because I think what I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really struck, this is, I guess, my own belief, it, it's really hard to affect social change. And it took hordes and hordes and hordes of women doing all kinds of different things um, all that time to, to, to finally achieve it. And they did, 
for some. Um, I, I just think the hard work that, that it that it takes. Um, and you know, we, we see today people wanting, think they have a good idea, and I think don't understand um, how hard it is, you know, how hard it is to change things. But it's yeah. possible, and that's that's what I think should be highlighted. That they did, they did. Okay, uh, this uh, questioner wants to know uh, about other uh, Native American women who supported the women's movement, uh, other than the Ojibwe woman that you talked about. Yes. Uh, there's a, another whole woman named Iota. Um, Remembering that they, they are operating under a, a double bind, that, that Native American women will, will not get suffrage until Native Americans are, are allowed to be citizens, and that doesn't happen until 1924. Uh, there, were, there were many. Um, not tripping off my tongue right now, but Iota, who was the, was the Navajo, was one. It was a, a program done about her just recently. Um, just because okay. I don't have it to put my tongue doesn't mean it doesn't exist. All right. Um, this is a question about the ERA, uh, the modern ERA. Uh, even though it was passed by Congress a while ago, if one more state were to ratify it now, today, would it take effect? Would it be valid? You know, I'm not sure about that. And you know, Virginia tried to do it and it failed by one vote in Virginia. Uh, and I, I assume they wouldn't be making the effort, right, if it, if it weren't going to count. And I, I know that some amendments have had, um, uh, what would you say, sunset laws or you know, limits, limits put on them. But I, I honestly don't know. I, I only know that why would they do it if they weren't going to work. All right, and so uh, another, I guess, related question, do you still think we should work for ratification of the ERA or should we turn our efforts to other issues? Um, you know, there, you know, as I say, a, a lot of rights have been obtained. Um, it, it, it's, I guess I would, I would answer it kind of like this. If, if, if the Supreme Court had not long ago narrowed the 14th Amendment, you remember um, the Slaughterhouse cases and the Myra Bradwell case where they, they, they said right away that it did not expand any rights. Um, if, if people today accepted the 14th Amendment um, as being valid, you know, one of the uh, people who are originalists don't. Um, that the, the probably the, the, the groundwork for, for granting equality is there. But given that that hasn't happened, I suppose um, to really kind of finish it up, it probably is worth still trying to pass the ERA. Okay, um, we still do have a few minutes. So if anyone has uh, another question, now's your chance, uh, type it in. Meanwhile, though, I have a question. Um, sure. And my question is this, we always hear that history is written by the winners. In the case of the uh, 19th Amendment, it was the women who won. So why, when I was a child, uh, the only term I knew, and I had no idea that it was pejorative, the only term I knew was suffragette for what these women were and what they had done. Since these women won their crusade, why was the derogatory term for what they were the one that survived? Well, I could say the 20s. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, well, a couple things. One, the winners did write it. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, you remember, wrote the book. Uh, on the history of the women's suffrage movement, which covers a movement up until 1900. And that has occluded a lot of, of actually, uh, of what we know about it. Um, women's history is, maybe it's, it's, I've been retired for 12 years, maybe they're doing a huge job of it now. Um, but there's very, very little in the textbook. You, you, you don't get a sense of it. And I don't know, I may have, I've shared this. Uh, I was at a seminar the summer of 73, maybe, I don't know, doesn't matter. 
week-long lecture by Gretchen Kreuter on women's history run uh, part of a summer at McAllister. I had taught for five years at that point. I had a master's degree, um, no big expert in American history, but I sat there the whole week and shook my head. Why don't I know this? You know, there are, there are gatekeepers um, that, that um, won't open the door for I'm just talking about schools of history. Um, but, you know, I'll just repeat again. I think best history takes a wider look, takes a lens, tries to figure a wider lens, tries to figure out what's going on. All right, we do have another question, but I think we still have time for uh, maybe a couple more after this one. So if you have another question uh, in the audience, please type it in now and get your, take your chance. All right, next question. I missed it. When did all black women get the right to vote? Okay. Most women in the South are denied the right to vote by grandfather clause, poll taxes, literacy tests. That does not end until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. You mean most black women, right? Most black women, right, black women, yeah. That mm -hmm. does not end until 1965. And that ends with the Voting Rights Act, which was, has, has then been slightly reinterpreted by the Supreme Court. All right, and then another question allied to that. Uh, uh, were there many black women engaged in the movement or was it largely white women? There were many black women. The screen, the last screen here just shows, uh, shows a handle. Women's involvement, black women's involvement was mainly through black women's clubs um, who sponsored all kinds of suffrage things. Uh, you know, the towering leaders, of course, were Ida Wells Burnett, Sojourner Truth, Frances Harper, Mary uh, Church Terrell, who, who was, I think, the more I read about her, the more amazing um, that she is. But, but there were many, many, um, many others. Um, I had not heard of um, uh, many of these people until I've done this. I, you know, I knew that I knew the major leaders. And, but, but I will say, I have noticed, and I have not yet gotten from the library, everything is slower. There are more and more and more books written about women of color in the suffrage movement. So I think, you know, that we'll discover that there are hugely more. And uh, this uh, next one is more of an observation, uh, but what is your comment? Uh, Wouldn't it be wonderful, says this uh, writer, if the tenacious women who fought for suffrage were dropped down into our own time uh, to fight voter suppression? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. speaking about those those tenacious women, one that I would love to hear more about, if you can tell us in one minute or less, is uh, Jeanette Rankin. She was in the Congress twice, yeah. uh, voted twice against uh, war, uh, lived to see or, or almost lived to see um, the non-passage of the ERA. Uh, she was elected to Congress, if, I, if I'm correct, before women got uh, right. yes. suffered. Yeah. Tell, tell us a, just a bit more about her, if you could. Well, she was obviously pretty young when she was elected. She was the first woman in Congress. She is the woman uh, who actually got the chance to introduce it to Congress in 1918, or to the House of Representatives. Uh, she served, I misspoke earlier, she did only serve for one term then. And, um, Maybe she lost because of the war, I don't, I don't know. Um, but then she came back in 1940, and that oh, just seems remarkable to me. Um, but, you know, was clearly active in politics, you know, all through that. Um, I don't know how old she was when first elected to Congress, but let's just say she was, she had to at least be 25, right? So 50 years later, the, the, I, there are photos of her showing her um, carrying one of them. She did march. Um, she didn't just go to Washington. Um, so, you know, clearly a lifelong commitment to pacifism. Okay. Well, I, I think we've come to the end of our questions, and I do want to thank our speaker, Janet Woolman. I also want to uh, cast my um, eyes uh, to next week, uh, moving on. Uh, we do have another series starting at this time, Tuesday afternoon, starting next week, a four-part series, Turning Points in the History of the American Presidency, 
J.B. Anderson, who's well known, I think, to many of the audience, will be talking about some of the uh, most memorable um, e electoral um, uh, incidents from uh, American presidential history. That will uh, that class will extend through October. Then, starting in November, we're going to have a series on the uh, history in the making. How will we remember the year 2020? I think everyone can uh, uh, agree that uh, 2020 is a memorable year from so many different aspects. I'm pleased to announce that Duchess Harris, whom again, I think many of you know, uh, Duchess Harris will be the opening speaker for that course. She will be talking about the legacy of George Floyd, a very Minnesota related topic, which has great, great interest. I also want to bring people's attention to another class, Great Decisions, which will start this Friday. We will have uh, Great Decisions is a course uh, brought to us uh, by um, Global um, Minnesota and the Foreign Affairs Association, as well as the library and OLLI. They gather together uh, speakers on various topics of interest, uh, the most important topics in American foreign relations. Um, the inaugural speaker for that series this coming Friday will speak on uh, the Philippines, the role of the Philippines oh, wow. in American history and American um, civil affairs today. So lots of things uh, to um, think about. Uh, all uh, descriptions of all these classes are available on the library's website and through the OLLI uh, catalog. And I hope to see many of the same people uh, to coming back for uh, the further series. But this one, unfortunately, is drawing to a close. So once more, thank you so much, Janet Woolman. And thanks to everyone who came thanks. today. Thanks to everyone.